Why is it possible for a tumor to grow in the absence of oxygen? Or even worse, a grow in cyanide. Cyanide is a respiratory poison. Remember the term, they drank the Kool-Aid? Well, well, the Kool-Aid was laced with cyanide. It kills, kills people, animals, whatever, very, very quickly. But not the tumor cell. The tumor cell can live without oxygen and can live in cyanide. And the reason it does that is because it uses an ancient form of energy, not dependent on oxygen, which is called fermentation. So if the tumor cell has access to glucose and the amino acid glutamine, it becomes very hard to kill. Not to say that you can't kill it, because you know we have a lot of so-called cancer survivors who have been irradiated and treated with toxic chemicals, poisonous toxic chemicals. Many people show tremendous reduction in the size of the tumor, giving, giving the appearance that, wow, this stuff is really working. But when you look at their overall survival, it's not much greater than doing nothing um, because their overall survival is increased by about two and a half months. Uh, with these various drugs, but the impression the impression was that the tumor looked like it was going away, but the patient really didn't live much, that much longer. If you can get into a, a zone about 2.0 or below on the glucose ketone index, what we developed here at BC, uh, you can be pretty well sure that your mitochondria are achieving a high state of health. All right, Dr. Seafried, briefly take me down to the cellular level. I want to kind of paint a, a picture for the viewers, for the listeners. What exactly is cancer and what problems do you see with the standard treatments? Okay, uh, well, thank you, Jorge. It's nice to be here. Um, yeah, uh, well, the um, cancer is defined as, as dysregulated cell growth cell division out of control is the uh, definition of cancer leading to the phenomenon of neoplasia, which is a group of cells growing out of control. Um, the origin of, of the out of control uh, condition is predominantly damage to a uh, chronic, chronic damage to the ability of the cell to generate energy through respiration, oxygen dependent respiration. Um, we all, all the cells in our body, or I should say almost all cells of our body except erythrocytes, uh, generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation, um, evidenced by the fact that I think you're breathing, right? Are you breathing right now? I am indeed uh, okay. breathing. And I think most people that would listen to this are probably breathing. Um, and they're, the reason they're breathing is to provide oxygen to generate energy. Because you have to test the hypothesis by um, stop your breathing for 10 to 15 minutes and see whether or not you can remain alive. How do, how, how do you think that's gonna work for the majority of people? Not too hot. Not too good. But if you had a tumor in your body and you were to stop breathing, you would be dead, but the tumor would not be dead. The tumor can function without oxygen, okay? Why is it possible for a tumor to grow in the absence of oxygen? Or even worse, a grow in cyanide. You know, you know what, cyanide is a respiratory poison, right? Remember the term, they drank the Kool-Aid? Well, well, the Kool-Aid was laced with cyanide, all right? So, um, and it killed a lot of people in Jonestown or wherever, wherever that place was. And that's because cyanide stops oxidative respiration. Okay. Um, it kills, kills people, animals, whatever, very, very quickly. But not the tumor cell. The tumor cell can live without oxygen and can live in cyanide. All right. And the reason it does that is because it uses an ancient form of energy, not dependent on oxygen, which is called fermentation. All right, so we ferment, you hear the term fermentation. Okay, it's an ancient form of energy metabolism that existed before oxygen came onto the atmosphere 2.5 billion years ago. 
So the cancer cell is doing nothing more than falling back on these ancient pathways of fermentation. And they grow dysregulated by using fermentation fuels. You need to use a large amount of fuel to generate energy if you're going to ferment. And you have to have, uh, in the environment of the tumor cell, there has to be a substantial amount of the fermentation energy in order for the tumor to grow uh, effectively because it doesn't use oxygen. So it takes in oxygen when the oxygen is available, but it doesn't use it to generate energy. It, it continues to ferment even in the presence of oxygen. What's going on? Why is it doing that? It's doing that because its organelle, the mitochondrion, which generates energy from ox oxygen respiration, is defective. Structurally, functionally, morphologically, enzymatically, there's a lot of abnormalities in the mitochondria of tumor cells. But the, but the cell is growing like crazy. And you say to yourself, well, how is it growing? It's growing based on fermentation. Ah, okay. Once, once you understand that the tumor cell grows using fermentation, then you have to say, what is the fuel that drives the fermentation? Because maybe if we take away the fuel providing energy for fermentation, maybe if we take away that fuel, the tumor cell won't be able to grow. So you say, okay, well, what are they using for fermentation energy? Glucose, the sugar glucose in the blood. And they're using an amino acid called glutamine. It's the most abundant amino acid in our body. So if the tumor cell has access to glucose and the amino acid glutamine, it becomes very hard to kill. Not to say that you can't kill it, because you know we have a lot of so-called cancer survivors who have been irradiated and treated with toxic chemicals, poisonous toxic chemicals. And those chemicals and radiation have been able to manage and kill tumor cells uh, in many, many people. The, pro the, uh, the, ob the problem, of course, is that many of those people will pay the price uh, for having body, you no, know, because how many people wanna rush down um, uh, on the state fair and just to say, okay, give me radiation and very toxic poisons, just in the case I might have cancer in my body. Can you do that for me? It's absurd, nobody wants to do that, right? So, um, but yet if you have cancer, that's what they do to you. They treat you with very toxic drugs and uh, radiation and all kinds of things that nobody would ever want to do, but for the fact they have this cancer. And if they survive, they pay a huge price for this in the form of, of health. But if you take away glucose and glutamine, uh, which can be done far, far easier by restricting glucose in the diets, by using specific drugs in low quantities, you can kill all, you can stop the glucose and the glutamine and thereby arrest the growth and actually kill the tumor cells because they, they, they are so driven by this energy, fermentation energy. When you take away the fermentation energy, they up and die. And, and generally you can do this with minimal or no toxicity. So you have to ask yourself, why is no one doing this? Okay. okay. Then you have to say, well, why wouldn't, Anybody who can read the scientific literature and understand what's going on, you have to say, well, why, why, why should that not be the standard of care for, for cancer? Just take away glucose and glutamine in cancer patients as they come into the clinic. Oh, you have breast cancer, you have colon cancer, you have bladder cancer, you have breast. They're all the same. Every type of cancer in any organ needs fermentation. Lung, breast, they all need glucose and glutamine. Brain, glucose, and glutamine. Every tumor that we've looked at needs glucose and glutamine. So that logical step, cancer is one singular, simple disease dependent on glucose and glutamine. So you'd say to yourself, well, if it's so simple and, so, and all cancers are the same, why is nobody doing this? Why, yeah, that, why would anyone not want to do this? That's something that I've seen in some of your interviews. Um, can you bring up briefly some of the problems like are there any clinical trials that have been done? And if not, then what is the hurdle in doing so? Well, clinical trials are very expensive. Okay. You have to recruit an army of physicians and you have to get hospital beds and you have to do all this kind of stuff. It's very expensive. If you have a therapy that doesn't generate the revenue that you would hope that if your trial worked, you would be able to make money. And if your trial works and it doesn't, uh, just the only the only beneficiary of the therapy is the patient themselves. 
The hospital doesn't stand to make much. The physicians don't stand to make much. The drug company doesn't stand to make much. The only beneficiary is the patient. And when that's the case, you're not gonna do a clinical trial. Or if you do a clinical trial, it's going to have to be married with some drug or some procedure that can generate revenue. Right. Even if the procedure or drug is counteractive to the metabolic therapy, they would still need to use it with the hope that they might get something a little bit better than the drug by itself. Okay. But many times you don't need that drug. Many times if you avoided the drug, the outcome and the survivability and quality of life would be better. But um, many patients are told that it's too, exper it's too experimental, it's difficult to do, um, it might harm you, uh, it, uh, like relative to what? Poisonous chemicals and radiation? I, is it gonna be harming you as much as that? So, oh, oh it hasn't been seen in enough people, Despite the fact that the science is rock solid, all of the, all of the excuses are generally, generally very peripheral. Um, but, but, and they're made to convey information to the patient that that might not be a good course of action. And, and another very uh, hurdle, big hurdle, is that um, most physicians and hospital uh, workers who ever do this um, don't know how to do it the training level is, is minimal or zero. And they've all been uh, indoctrinated to think cancer is a genetic disease and not, a, and not anything else other than a genetic disease. So the hurdles are one after another. And um, there'll be no major progress in managing cancer until those hurdles go down. So as long as we're uh, spoon-fed immunotherapies and all this crazy stuff you see on television, they show you, yes, there are cancer patients who have done very well on immunotherapies, um, but they're not talking about the significant number who have been killed quick. Um, and it's in the scientific literature that just people don't read it. Oh, I, if I saw that, I would have read it. Well, it's in there. You just don't, if you want to look up, just look up adverse effects uh, on immunotherapies. And if you see it on television at night, oh, they show you some guy smiling with his wife, and then most of the commercial is all the horrible adverse effects that can happen if you do this immunotherapy. Well, they wouldn't say that if these people were, were un, unaffected. So they're just trying to protect themselves that, oh, I took immunotherapy. You told me I was going to live a better life. Oh, but you didn't read the fine print that you could die faster if you took the immunotherapy. What are some of those other than an early death, like you just mentioned, what are some of those other adverse effects? Well, it's nausea, vomiting, actually accelerate called hyper hyperaggressive or hyperproliferative disease, where the tumor cells actually grow faster, which is the last thing you want to do. Uh, but 20% of the people that get some of these therapies, they die fast, faster than they would have done if they did nothing. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. But then there's another, another group of people who it really doesn't do anything. I mean, it has almost, it doesn't make it worse, nor does it make it better. And then there's about 20% of people that where it does actually work. So, so uh, they're living longer. So you're going to focus if you're going to be trying to sell this product, you don't. You want to focus on the guys that are doing well. You don't want to focus on the individuals where the drug had no no effect, or the ones that actually kill the patients faster. But 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 they say that in the in the in the, and and of course, if you're the one suffering, you don't. You also don't want to hear about the guys who died fast. Nor do you want to hear about the where the people where it didn't work. So you're focusing and looking at the smiling face as if that's going to be you. Okay, so. Um, but you know, they're do, they're they're doing using very expensive drugs to kill cancer cells through uh, an immunological uh, process by which our T cells uh, are going to go out, our immune cells, killer T cells, going to kill the cancer cell. The problem with that sometimes is the marker on the surface of the tumor cell that's being attacked by our immune system. That same marker can exist on the cells of our normal organs like kidney and liver and things like this. So you can have massive kidney, liver failure, all kinds of other failures because the immune cell is not only attacking the tumor cell, but it's also going after some of your normal organs. Um, you know, uh, collateral damage, adverse effects, um, all these kinds of things. Uh, you know, but people are willing to take the risk to be in that 20% of people who do really well. But my, my argument is why would you do that 
if we if metabolic therapy can be far more effective and non-toxic, and not only that, your whole body gets better. It's not just the tumor that are being hammered and eliminated. Uh, your liver, kidney, and all the other organs in your body, your brain, they get healthier. Uh, your overall body gets healthier when you do metabolic therapy. So uh, the problem is it's for a lot of people, it's too simple. You don't make any money on it. I don't know how to do it. Uh, it's always like some litany of, of excuses for not, for not doing it. But, you know, at some point, you know, we're going to have enough long-term survivors to say, I want to, this is the way I went and I'm doing well. Pablo Kelly is one of these guys. So glioblastoma, he's out seven years. And we're getting more and more. And eventually we'll push, push enough uh, case reports into the literature where people are eventually going to say, oh, I want to do this. Right. So it just takes time. So you said around 20% can have even worse effects than, you know, just not doing, not doing chemo. Yeah, and then if, if, you, if you want, I can send you the scientific, it was for lung cancer. Uh, but, okay. I, but I've seen, I've seen um, you know, stage four lung cancer um, using, using these procedures. They can, some patients can die faster. Um, and the wealthy people, the guys who have a lot of money, they go to the top medical schools and get some of these immunotherapies. And, 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 some, and some do well, uh, and, and some die real quick, okay? So you have to ask what happened to Blake Nordstrom of the Nordstrom uh, department store, why he died in like two or three weeks, or um, what's his name, Paul Allen. I mean, these guys went in and how can you die from cancer in three weeks? I mean, it, it, it should never happen. So something, something went wrong with whatever they treated them with. Um, right. You know, so, so yeah, so the poor people who can't afford these immunotherapies, which are massively expensive, um, they, they more or less go for the immunotherapy, for the, for the metabolic therapy, because it's not, it's not that expensive and it works. And it can work a hell of a lot better if, if, if the drugs that work synergistically with the metabolic therapy could be made more widely available for the cancer patients, which are basically non-toxic drugs. So you have to target this, the glucose and the glutamine simultaneously while, under, while the patient is in nutritional ketosis. So it's a three-step process. You got to get the patient into nutritional ketosis, number one, with blood measurements. Number two, you begin the treatment to target further the glucose. And number three, you target the glutamine at the same time you're targeting the glucose. So it's, it's a three-part uh, stage process, right? It's called therapeutic ketosis, followed by, by specific drugs that work synergistically while the patient is in therapeutic ketosis. Not that hard, not that difficult, you know, but a, but a lot of the, a lot of the uh, treatment falls on the shoulder of the patient. The patient must be compliant in getting into therapeutic ketosis. And if the patient is not compliant, or if the family members of the patient are not recognize, do not recognize what this patient must do, then it's unlikely that the therapy will work as effectively as it could. So it's a team effort on the part of the patient, the family, and the drugs and diets that are all working together. Right. I, I don't know. Is that, is that too complicated to understand? No, definitely not. But before we get into the specifics of how to do a ketogenic diet, before we started this episode, you told me, you know, it's, it's like a medicine. You have to be specific with dosing. You have to be specific with uh, a, a actual me you know, medicinal protocol. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you just off of the chemotherapy and radiation side, since we've talked about, you know, the 20% that doesn't do well and does worse, the 20% that may do well, what's that percentage that may, you know, they may not do anything to. And if, yeah. and, and once you tell me that number, if you know it, then, you know, do you think the risks outweigh the benefits? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, it's that middle range where I've spoken to a number of people and the publications themselves say, you know, the, the tumor continues uh, uh, to grow. Now, here's, here's another thing that's very interesting. There was a paper published in 2020 uh, where they examined um, 92 different drugs that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration since 2000 to 2016, 92 or 93 drugs all different kinds of immunotherapies and, 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 uh, and other, uh, other chemotherapies. And the uh, progression, the overall survival was increased by 2.4 months. Um, now, what's interesting about some of these tumors, this is a very interesting ph phenomenon. When you look under the, uh, uh, visualize the cancer using PET scan, MRI, CAT scan, or whatever tool you happen to be using, blood, blood, cancer markers or whatever you're using. 
almost everybody, not almost everybody, but many people show tremendous reduction in the size of the tumor, giving, giving the appearance that, wow, this stuff is really working. But when you look at their overall survival, it's not much greater than doing nothing um, because their overall survival is increased by about two and a half months uh, with these various drugs. But the impression, the impression was that the tumor looked like it was going away, but the patient really didn't live much, that much longer. So it's one of these really like, I don't know, it's uh, you know bait and switch kind of thing. Oh, you know, it looks great, but it's, oh. And, and I think, um, you know, what's the, what's the assessment for success? Okay, well, if, if you have the majority of your patients dying in 14 to 15 months, uh, and you new, use this new drug or, or, or approach, and your patients now are living to 16 or 17 months, then would can they consider that a major success? You know, uh, give me a break. I mean, this is absurd. You know, um, but this is these these are the so if I do a if the if a, if a drug company wants to do a big clinical trial and they show that they can extend life by two 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 months three months longer than the current standard, they consider that a success, and then that drug is then uh, marketed. So so. Um, but you know, I don't consider that a success. I consider Pablo Kelly a success. A guy who, who uh, a young man your age, how old are you? 21. Oh, well, you're young. Uh, pa well, Pablo was 26 when he was diagnosed. Not much difference, right? Okay, he's out seven years. Okay, so, uh, and, and he had a, a, what we call a therapeutic mutation that actually helped him. It was a mutation that actually targeted glucose and glutamine. Um, but he's out, um, 85 months, this maybe 86 months now. So uh, he has a web, a web uh, thing. Uh, he has a Facebook and web. He's willing to talk to anybody about what he did. And they wrote him off as just being a lucky guy. He lived so long because he was just a lucky guy. And, and, and he gets very angry because he said, I'm not just a lucky guy. I worked really, really hard to maintain <laughs> my diet and lifestyle issues. I changed everything. He said, it was, I'm not a lucky bloke. They call him a lucky bloke in England. Um, they don't want to know about these guys because it'll upset the apple cart. I mean, if you can get a regular number of people not living an extra two or three months, but how about an extra three or four years? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the key. How long can you get people to live? Uh, that's my line. I, uh, quality of life and overall survival are the two baselines that I look at for success. You, you tell me you have a drug or somebody tells me I have a drug and for glioblastoma, Oh, I, instead of 17 months, 16 months, yeah, I, I'll keep I'll keep them alive for um, you know uh, 50 months. Well, I, then I would consider that a, a, a great success. Um, but I don't see that other than metabolic therapy. Oh yeah, every now and then you'll find a guy who who survived with standard of care, but he did metabolic therapy, he did something else. Um, but you know they could live so much better if they if they didn't if they could avoid the radiation and they can avoid those poisons that they give you steroids and all this kind of crap um yeah but do you, you know, find they're, they're just not there yet do you find that a few or a lot of the people who do standard of care also do something alternative yes in fact the majority of them do it the majority of them yeah but they take a whole hodgepodge of stuff you know they're taking uh, alpha lipoic acid metformin right curcumin you know uh, they're taking like all kinds of stuff and, 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 you know, you don't really know to what extent all this kind of stuff is, is, is doing something or not doing something. Right. Um, you know, you know our, our guy from Egypt, a brain cancer guy, uh, again, a young man, a farmer, uh, he, he was forced into heavy dose radio, even though he was doing really, really well. He had no, no uh, he was doing remarkably well. They, we had to give him radiation because they said they had to in Egypt. He did. He survived that. I mean, he did really well after that. But then he started having headaches and things at 30 months, and he passed away. And the pathology re report showed uh, brain liquefaction. The radiation treatment liquefied the guy's brain, and he died from that. So, uh, um, had he not done the radiation, uh, we don't know how long he could have lived. But um, you know, this is what, and they don't want to talk about these things. So uh, pseudo progression, all these kinds of things from what? Why are you doing? Why, why are you seeing all that? Um, Pablo Kelly 
he didn't start doing the debulking surgery until three year, years after and he avoided he avoided any toxic insult to his body. And he was able to do that. Now he had a, a IDH1 mutation, which is a therapeutic mutation. I, I don't know if, but I think any anybody that would target uh, glucose and glutamine simultaneously while under nutritional ketosis can do better. I don't care what kind of cancer they have. They'll all, they'll all do better if they're adherent to the, and, and the diets aren't that bad. Oh, people say, I can't deal with all this fat and stuff. I wanna eat pizza and rice and potatoes. Well, you have to give certain things up. Um, but Pablo's on a kind of a carnivore diet. He's maintaining his, 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 he's eating steaks with butter on it, you know, eggs with butter. I mean, it's not so restrictive. I mean, a lot of people could live like that. Um, but, you know, some vegans can, can get down into these zones. So it's not like it's impossible. There's enough foods out there to people for, for, to make it uh, 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 palatable and, and tolerable. So there, and then you use the drugs. The key is you got to use the drugs. And these aren't just this indiscriminate drugs. These are drugs that work simultaneously. They work as a team together with the diet. And they really take on a new power, massive power on these drugs. So you don't right. have to use as much. And they work like, whoa, what do you? And you don't have to be uh, so harshly treated. You don't, you don't have to have the adverse effects that all these other things. You don't have to have your hair gone. You see all these poor cancer patients, they got bald heads. What the hell was going on with that, right? Right? Why? Why you have your hair fall out? You're trying to kill the tumor cell, not make yourself go bald, right? Yeah, right. Metabolic therapy does not make people go bald. Let's put it that way. You know, ripping yeah. breasts off women. I mean, they're doing all kinds of mutilations. I mean, what is all this nonsense? You know, and there's plenty of evidence to say that stuff is just not necessary. Not necessary to do that. Right. Yeah, I'm sure there are quite a few people and, and myself included until I found your work and I started getting into nutrition and a bunch of lifestyle habits um, that think that genetics are a huge part of it. So what, what percentage would you say is genetic and what percentage would you say is environmental for developing well, cancer? Let's look at it from the perspective of risk factors. It's what is it a genetic? Do we have a genetic risk factor, a gene that would predispose us? Uh, do we live in a very toxic environment uh, that would have many chemical uh, risk factors, uh, environmental risk factors, because you can't get cancer if your mitochondria are healthy. Okay, so the risk factor has to be something that is going to interfere with the ability of the mitochondria to produce energy through uh, oxygen respiration. All right, so when you say, oh, this woman inherited the BRCA1 mutation. The BRCA1 mutation is a risk factor for developing breast cancer. But that, that genetic risk factor uh, increases the risk only if the mutation harms the mitochondria. There are only about 50% uh, of women with, with the BRCA1 mutation don't get breast cancer because the mutation never interfered with their mitochondria. Same with these other risk factors. I think the highest one is the Lee Fraumeni risk factor, which is a mutation in the P53 um, gene that controls mitochondrial respiration. So about 90% of people with the, uh, P, with the P53 Lee Fraumeni are at risk for developing a range of cancers, but it's not 100%. There are 10%, 15% of people that have that exact same mutation who never develop cancer. So the primary cause of cancer is damage to the respiration, regardless of whether that's caused by a chemical. Like we can take a hundred people and expose them to car a powerful carcinogen, like asbestos or something like this. Um, but not everybody in the group gets cancer. Suppose 80% 80, 80 of the people get cancer and, the, and every cancer that you look at, that person has damaged respiration. But for whatever reason, you know, 20% of the people, they were exposed to the same thing, they didn't get cancer. Because that chemical asbestos or whatever chemical you're talking about, tetrahydrochloride or any of the chemical risk factors, carcinogens, didn't damage that guy's respiration for whatever reason. We don't know that. But, but so you say, well, we're, are, we're in a, a cancer pandemic um, with, you know, right now, okay, uh, uh, COVID is killing about the same number of people per day as cancer does. But COVID is not going to be killing these. We're going to eventually adapt to the virus and we're all going to become vaccinated. And the, 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 
the, the deaths from COVID will, will gradually go down. But the deaths from cancer aren't going down. They go up uh, and it's becoming a cancer pandemic. So you say, what the hell is going on here? And it's just the, the bottom line is that our diets and lifestyles are putting us at risk for a variety of risk factors, exposure to a variety, a variety of risk, risk factors that will um, increase our, the, our, our probability of getting cancer. So it's basically diet and lifestyle. And uh, uh, genetics is a risk factor, but it's not a fait accompli that if I have this mutation, I'm gonna get 100%, I'm gonna get risk. Like Angelina Jolie who gets her breasts removed, ovaries or whatever, whatever else, that was unnecessary. All you have to do is, is maintain healthy mitochondria. And even if you had the BRCA1, it, the probability of getting cancer would be massively reduced. And, and movie actors always like to be thin, and good looking and healthy. So that was the therapy that should have been instituted, right? So, um, you know, uh, once you have knowledge and you understand the origin of the disease and you understand what's responsible for the abnormal cell growth, then you know really how to attack it and you know how to, how to manage it uh, without toxicity. So, um, yeah, so you want to talk about genetics? Gen genes are risk factors. Uh, chemical carcinogen, a risk factor. Um, if you're exposed to radiation, radiation is a risk factor for developing cancer. That's why people, when the, when the uh, nuclear reactor uh, uh, in Japan, the Fukushima, whatever it was, the people in Seattle are digging themselves into bunkers so they don't get the radiation that's coming over in the clouds from Japan. Why? Oh, I don't want to get cancer. What the hell? If you have cancer, they, 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 they irradiate you. So uh, um, it's a short-term fix, but they put you at risk for potential. Okay, what else? Intermittent hypoxia, viruses, all right? Hepatitis. Uh, papillomavirus, hepatitis C virus. These are called uh, oncogenic viruses. They're risk factors for developing various kinds of cancers. Why? Because the virus damages the respiration in a certain population of cells. Hepatitis C, generally liver cancer, because the virus gets into the liver cells and damages the respiration, leading to the first step in the, in the, in the development of cancer, right? So papillomavirus, you know, for urogenital areas and, and um, so you have all of these different risk factors that come from, uh, yeah, you can have a genetic risk factor, you have environmental risk factors, exposure, intermittent hypoxia, all of these age, hey, the older you get, the, the higher the probability your mitochondria in some organ will be damaged. That's why cancer is more prominent, more, more common in older people than younger people. I mean, once you understand the origin of the disease and how it happens, all this stuff makes complete sense. And it also puts you on a path to know how to manage it and prevent it, okay? But, you know, we live in a very toxic environment. Our lifestyle choices, we're constantly bombarded with foods that are poorly nutritious, put a lot of sugar into our blood. Sugar doesn't cause cancer, but sugar can cause inflammation. And inflammation can cause cancer by damaging mitochondria in some population of cells. Once you read what we have written and, and connected all of the dots, you can see how cancer arises, what causes it, uh, how, how, to, how to manage it, and how to prevent it. A large part of it, maybe not, you can't know exactly the percentages, but a large part of it is, is lifestyle. It is the fermentation of sugars that does not require oxygen um, in dysfunctional mitochondria that is essentially a root cause of cancer. Well, yeah, but it has to be a chronic. Generally, the, the damage comes chronically over years doesn't just you know wake up there are there are defects in mitochondria that that are, are very rare mitochondrial inherited diseases like and they cause blindness deafness um, and these kinds of things um, you know barth syndrome is, is a, a disease of children that damages uh, mitochondrial respiration but those kids rarely get cancer because for whatever reason barth syndrome keeps blood sugars low and many kids die of heart attacks at a very young age. So you really don't see the cancer. So, um, so yeah, when you look at all the different, uh, you can explain, we can explain about 95 or 98% of all cancers, the, how they come, how they, they, they arise. Um, it's environmental risk. Okay, you, if you're living in a toxic environment, with a lot of chemicals and pollutants and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, you put your body at, at, at a risk. Um, you know, as I said, primitive peoples, our ancestral peoples, you know, the cancer was far less common in those people. Uh, animals in the wild, um, most wild animals, cancer is rare. Um, domesticated dogs are riddled with cancer, just like humans. Why? 
they're eating the same crap we are. They're not getting exercise. They're eating uh, high carbohydrate foods. They're fat. Um, and they get all kinds of cancer. So the wolves rarely, if ever, get cancer, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so, so everything makes complete sense. Chimpanzees, our closest relative, they've never had a breast cancer documented in a female chimp. What the hell's going on with that? They're 98% similar to us in, in gene expression profiles. They don't get cancer. They get, they, they don't, rare, very rare cancer in chimps, you know? So uh, you put it all together and it becomes very clear. Uh, but nobody wants to talk about this, right? right? They don't want to talk because we've been in a society where we're running down to the supermarket to get some highly processed food because it's fast, it's convenient and cheap. And we eat it, we get obese, we get all kinds of other issues. Oh, by the way, you damage mitochondria and some, you put yourself at risk for cancer. So it's not just cancer. How about type two diabetes? How about dementia? How about all these different kinds of things? They're all uh, indirectly related to the diet and lifestyle. So in terms of prevention, um, what are some biomarkers that people can test for healthy mitochondria? If you're in therapeutic ketosis, okay? So um, nutrition, we call it nutritional ketosis. When, you're, when your blood level of glucose is low and your levels of blood ketone bodies are high. And um, if you can get into a, a zone about 2.0 or below on the glucose ketone index, what we develop here at BC, uh, you can be pretty well sure that your mitochondria are achieving a high state of health. So um, I have friends like my friend, Dominic Diagostino. Uh, he's like in, in, in nutritional ketosis all the time. Um, Jeff Volek, these guys that I know, they're, they're, really, they're really advocates and they themselves keep their body uh, in these states of nutritional ketosis. Um, but some people can't do that. It's, it requires some significant discipline. So every now and then you might want to consider at least intermittent fasting or any of these kinds of things that can give your body a break. Um, you know, give your cells a break on, on what they do every day and see if it can blow that blood sugar a little bit and elevate the ketones just a little bit. And it, it just reduces risk. That's all. I'm not saying you can never get cancer if you're in nutritional ketosis. All I'm saying is that the risk of getting cancer is, is less. So um, how much less? I don't know. How, uh, you know we, we just have to um, you know, wait for all the data to come in. And would you recommend doing a ketogenic diet long term or kind of doing like a targeted ketogenic diet or cyclical? You know, I, I don't I can't recommend anything to anyone. You know, uh, they can read about it. They want to do it themselves. I see a lot of people that are um, in the um, bodybuilding and I don't know what you call it, super nutrition categories. They monitor their glucose ketone index. They don't have cancer, uh, but they just want to know. And, and, you know, some people say, well, how long can you remain in the GKI zone? You know, I, I don't know. Um, we do it only to kill cancers. We're not, we're not into keeping everybody in GKI zones uh, all the time because it's tough. It's not easy. Um, but I know people who have managed their cancer uh, long-term or in these zones uh, because they want to stay alive and uh, feel healthy and they want to feel good about themselves. You know, Guy Tannenbaum has a nice website. He's, he's managing his advanced prostate cancer very, very successfully uh, doing these uh, fasting exercises. So I can't recommend... Uh, anything. All I can do is provide knowledge. If you, anybody, what I just said should be uh, apparent to anyone. Uh, you can buy the, 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 uh, the meter, the keto, keto mojo meter, precision extra meter, all these. Keto mojo is good because they, they, they have a little button you just push and immediately gives you the, G, the, the GKI value, singular number. But anybody who can do mathematics, uh, simple math can get the same thing. You just divide the millimolar glucose by millimolar ketones and you get a number that that number is low, you're in, you're in nutritional ketosis, your mitochondria are, are benefiting significantly, your whole body is benefiting significantly. And you stay in the zone for as long as you want. And then you can transition in and out of these zones. But the, but the issue here is that each time you're in the, one of these zones, uh, your body is being relieved of stress, your, your, your energetic efficiency is improved. Um, and most people say, you know, I've done it a little bit, you know, but if I had cancer, I know exactly what to do. Um, but, you know, uh, you know I, I stop eating, you know, periodically and, you know, these kinds of things just reduce risk. That's all. So you, know, you don't follow a ketogenic diet? No. Um, you know, I, I guess I could, but why? 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 Oh, I, yeah, but if I stay, you can do it by just don't eat. 
you know, uh, um, but you have to do to get it really into good ketosis, but you're gonna have to do it for like a week. The older you are, the harder it is. So it's better just to, just to go eat, eat, eat foods that are low glycemic uh, carbohydrate, like, all right, eat meat, um, butter on it, like Pablo is doing. You know, um, it's not so bad. I mean, I can deal with a big bone in ribeye, you know, uh, melted with butter, melted all over it, but that's all I would eat. I wouldn't eat anything else. Uh, maybe a tiny amount of, of, of vegetable. Um, if I'm going to do vitamin C, I would do grapefruit because grapefruit is a very low glycemic vitamin, uh, vitamin C fruit. You don't need much. Your body, okay, take a couple of little uh, triangles of grapefruit. You don't have to eat pound down a great big thing. You don't like it if it's, drink the juice. I mean, it, uh, none of this will spike blood sugar and you get a lot of vitamin C, which is very healthy. Um, People say, well, I'm a vegan, I can't do it. Well, yeah, vegans can do, they just have to adapt their diet and lifestyle to get a GKI. So GKI is, the, is the, the standard by which everything is judged. So you can get into a low glucose elevated ketones with a vegan diet and you can get in with a carnivore diet. So as long as, as long, whatever you can, and if you say, well, I can eat this, I, can, I don't know. Eat that and see what it does to your GKI. If it elevates your GKI, don't eat that. You know, so uh, you, each person is an individual machine. And they need to know what their body is best at. So, and then they would record all this information and then they would know uh, what they can or cannot eat. So it's one of those kinds of things. Yeah, I'm sure by now, probably most people are familiar with nutritional ketosis and a ketogenic diet. Uh, but for the people listening that are not very familiar with it, nutritional ketosis is basically getting up your, your blood ketone levels to a specific level, restricting carbohydrates uh, and glucose. To what level would you say of, of ketones would be considered ketosis? Oh, I would say probably anything above one, uh, one millimolar. Um, you know, if you can get up into, you know, Dom can get up, up to six millimolar, you know, but you get up there, you got to be careful. Sometimes you get some heart palpitations. You have to be careful on the salts. Uh, Miriam Kalamian's book, Keto for Cancer, uh, and Patricia Daly, uh, her food choices. There's a lot of books out there to tell you exactly how to do all this stuff, uh, what foods to eat, what you should be monitoring, any, any issues that, that might be, because your body's going to go through a, a really interesting metabolic transition as you go, go to these new zones, these, these new states of physiological health. And some people can get into the zone faster and easier than than other people so but i would say this is not something to be done uh without some prior knowledge uh and also a physical exam i think uh you need to know whether or not you're healthy enough you know some people try to do this and it could be counterproductive uh if they have an underlying um, uh, problem um some physiological or medical problem that's underlying you know they might not i would always get a good physical checkup and see, uh, okay, I'm healthy. I don't have this issue. Now, if you have type two diabetes, then that will go away. Uh, we know that uh, nutritional ketosis can abolish. Uh, that was the Verda Health Company. They're they're curing type two diabetes using metabolic therapy, which is essentially nutritional ketosis. So, um, so all these things are out there. I I just think that what I'm telling people is that the availability of knowledge. But I think Miriam Kalamian's book Keto for Cancer touches upon a lot of these, even if you don't have cancer, her, her recommendations in there are very valuable. What would be some of those underlying conditions that would not be conducive for a ketogenic diet? Uh, well, I think some heart issues could be a problem. There might be um, a carnitine. You know, some people have, have rare inherited uh, problems. There are these, what they call rare inborn errors of metabolism, where fatty acids cannot go into the liver to be broken down to ketone bodies. I mean, th there's people out there that have these rare things. Um, you wanna make sure that you, you know, uh, that your body is capable of doing this. You wouldn't wanna be doing it if you just had open heart surgery. I mean, there, there's, uh, there's a, a number of things that you, you, that you should know. That's why I would go to a physician and, and look at your overall state of health and, um, and then gradually. And another thing too, you don't wanna go I think sometimes cold turkey, I, I, I think um, there's a lot of ways to get to the so-called promised metabolic state. Um, you know, intermittent fasting can get you there, intermittent, uh, low, car low carbohydrate diets, low glycemic diets, things that make you comfortable. And, 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 and you don't wanna go in like 
too aggressively on this. Let the, let the body adjust as you go through this. And then back off when you feel it's uncomfortable and then go ahead and do it again. Now, if you're a cancer patient, that's a different story because the, 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 the faster you get into these states, the, the better off you're gonna kill your tumor cells and the better off the drugs that we, that we use will work better. So, um, you know, how fast you wanna do that. That's a life-threatening, you're talking life-threatening conditions as opposed to someone who just wants to transition from an unhealthy state to a healthier state. So let's, I wanna get into specifics real quick. Um, so first, the first pillar is getting into a ketogenic diet, but obviously there are quite a few different variations of a ketogenic diet. So what is the one that you think would be best for treating cancer? You know, I can't, I can't answer that because it's all based on the glucose ketone index. That's the way we judge whether or not an individual is ready for the drugs. So once, once the individual reach, reaches uh, um, nutritional ketosis, they, they might need to do, everybody could be different. So the bottom line is when am I ready to take the drugs needed to kill off my tumor cells? Once you get into therapeutic ketosis, nutritional ketosis. Okay, so the vegan may get there in a very different strategy than the carnivore. So, so but how do they know when they're ready? It's the glucose ketone index. So that's individual. People have to look at that themselves. Got so it. it becomes very hard to provide a specific just get into the just get into the nutritional zone that we we've, we've published and if you're in the zone you know you're there okay now you can take drugs and people say well i i can't get into the zone i, I can't get into the zone and i said that, well they're taking medications they're doing this and doing that um you know if you're, you're a young guy i can guarantee you you can get into the zone you're not taking any medications right Jorge? no okay, nothing good. you're 21 just like the students in the they get in real quick you, got, you can be in complete ketosis in about five, four or five days. Really, really good. Uh, but, you know, somebody my age uh, who's been, in, or a guy on, who's been addicted to carbs his whole life, he's not going to be able to do that anytime soon. And you got to get off all of the medications. A lot of times the medications people are on prevent them from getting into the, into the zone. Oh, I take, you know, these old people, they got, they got a box of pills, right? Like a tackle box full of every kind of a colored pill. Give me a break. You know, what the hell are they doing with that? I don't take any pills, you know, uh, um, but uh, those pills can sometimes interfere with getting into uh, nutritional ketosis. So depends on your age, your health status, a lot of different things. So uh, um, got it. Got it. So so it's not a specific, you know, one size fits all ratio no, fats to proteins no, to carbs. No, no, it's not. You know, so it's a combination of restricted caloric intake together with the types of, of uh, fats. Some fats are healthy, some fats are less healthy. You know, a ghee, this is good. Natural butter is good. Um, as I said, any food source that has very low carbohydrate in it uh, would be an acceptable uh, food, cons food to consume. I wanna get your thoughts on polyunsaturated omega-6 fats because that's been a huge point of controversy in the past few decades. What are your thoughts on those kind of like corn oil or grapeseed or canola? Yeah, I don't take any of it. I mean, uh, I mean the, the bottom line is, is that why, why you wanna take that? What are you doing? What are people doing? Why are they doing that? Um, uh, uh, you know, and again, if you wanna manage cancer, if you're going to get your GKI, you're going to have to cut down on those kinds of fats anyway. So well, people will say, oh, there's some of it in meat. Yeah, there are, but, but it's not enough to really get excited about, especially when you're not eating much of it. Uh, get yourself into the, into, the, into the zone. And don't forget, most of the um, fatty acids that provide the greatest amount of ketones are um, saturated fatty acids, medium chain saturated fatty acids interesting okay. okay okay so that's the the liver loves those things so your your adipose tissue is loaded with saturated fatty acids and they come out of the fat cells they go into the bloodstream they go to the liver and the liver chops them up like a wood chopper and then puts out the water soluble ketone bodies which then circulate through your blood it goes to your brain your brain starts taking in much less glucose and transitioning to ketones your heart burns ketones beautifully the energy of your heart increases. My late good friend Richard Veach showed that. So, um, so I mean, there's a lot of health benefits of getting into nutritional ketosis. So, are you are you concerned about because you already mentioned that high quality fats are 
you know, some of the I saturated don't know about high fats. quality people, you know, people think saturated fat is, is not high, you know, omega three fatty acids, the fish oil. Right. Um, yeah, that's good. I mean, I mean, uh, we, we, that, that's not going to harm you. Um, that, that has health benefits. It doesn't generate much ketones by the way, because it's a polyunsaturated fatty acid, but, but it, 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 it has other health benefits, keeps trigly triglyceride levels low. So I have no problem with taking some small amount of, of, of omega-3 fatty acids, not the omega-6, but the omega-3. And um, uh, although omega-6, like arachidonic acid, we need that for uh, infl inflammatory uh, processes, but only when it's, when it's well-regulated. Uh, again, a, a lot of things out of control. And eating massive amounts of fat to see how high you can get your ketones uh, is also unhealthy. So, uh, um, you know, you have to be very logical and common sense about this whole thing, you know, but you know how people are, they just go overboard doing stupid things. And, uh, oh, if I eat, uh, you know, I'm going to sit down and eat a tub of lard. Uh, well, that's not going to help you out. But people do that. It's like, give me a break. Don't they, they read the literature? Don't they read? Oh, I just want to get, as they keep going, but eat this lard. Well, that's not going to help you that much. Right. Um, if at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fat, but it's not the right kind of fat, you know, medium chain triglycerides, you can get MCT oil, uh, but that's only, it tastes like crap, you know, eat the natural foods, um, you know, avocado has saturated fats, you know, there's natural, natural foods that have fats. So, uh, um, you know, all these things helpful. Right. So not necessarily animal fats. Well, my Pablo's on a carnivore diet. I mean, what are you going to say about that? He, he eats uh, liver. He eats kidneys, he eats um, steaks, big steaks, lamb chops, you know, everything soaked in massive amounts of ghee and butter. So, and he doesn't eat much of it. That's another thing. He's right. not like sitting down there um, like some caveman. You know, he, he's just eating a small amount. It's called, it's called a paleolithic diet. It's called these paleolithic diets. Because don't forget our ancestors had very little access to high carbohydrate foods. All right, so most of our ancestors were in a paleolithic state, moderate to mild ketosis all the time. So they lived in that state, but not because they, they wanted to, they, they, they had to. This is what the environment gave them. They, there was not a lot of, of, um, of processed, wasn't any processed sugar. I mean, maybe a, a ripe fruit or something, honey, uh, something like that would give them a shot, but, but nothing else. Right. You know, so... Yeah, you know, from what I've seen doing research myself and from interviewing uh, other doctors and researchers is that there's a lot of gray area with cholesterol and saturated fat. Is that something that you are concerned about people taking in saturated fat from animal sources? No, no, I care less. You know, it's I, I, I because mo as most of it has to be restricted anyway. If you take small amounts of this stuff, as I said, if you overdo it. Yeah, I guess if there's some guy that sat down and ate five pounds of steak a week or 10 pounds a week and stuff like that. That's, but then look at his GKI, see what happened to it. You know, look at the triglycerides. When, you, when you're healthy, uh, your triglyceride levels are low. Uh, your your um, ratio of HDL to LDL is close to unity. Uh, cholesterol levels are quite moderate. Um, you, don't, you should not see any abnormal uh, blood work. Blood work should be pristine. You know, you're 21 years old. Your blood work theoretically should be pristine, right? So you get a guy who is doing uh, metabolic uh, nutritional ketosis and he's 75 or 80 and his blood work looks just like yours, right? Uh, okay, what is he doing? Okay, so, um, and you can, you can get into those states because you're taking small amounts of very nutritious materials that aren't gonna spike your blood sugar. So, um, so that's, that's the whole thing. So look at your blood work. Yeah. It, look at the triglycerides cholesterol. If you're on a, I mean, our studies show beautiful cholesterol values, uh, HDL, it's have to be measured in HDL, LDL kind of ratios, but they look really beautiful when you're on. If you say, Oh, I got my triglycerides high on this keto. No, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Stop eating. Go on and go water only fasting. You'll see how, how clear things become. Oh, I can't do that. It's too hard. Well, then then do something else. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to tell people what to do. Uh, I just provide, you know, the knowledge of what they can do if they want to do these things. 
I've heard Dr. Dominic D'Agostino talk about how sardines are one of the foods which really raise up your ketone levels. Are there any other kinds of foods that you would recommend? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Dom is the big guy on this and uh, Miriam Kalamian and, um, you know, some of the other guys that are, you know, Nasha Winters, they, they, they write about all these different things. You know, our job is to kill tumor cells. Um, that's what we do. You know, our job is to eliminate cancer from the body in a non-toxic strategy. Um, and uh, that's, I'm, I'm not into telling people how to get super healthy uh, as much as I am into saying you had a tumor once and now it's not there. And you're healthier when you emerge from metabolic therapy. You feel right. like fiddle is fit as a fiddle. You've never felt better in your life. Your hair looks good. Your skin color looks good. You're, you're not suffering. You don't look like death warmed over. You know, and, and you're, oh, I had diabetes. That's gone. No, I had this other problem. It's gone. Oh, by the way, my cancer is gone along with these other things. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, what the, that's what I look for, that, that kind of response. And okay, so we, we mentioned the first kind of pillar, which is, you know, getting into doing the proper ketogenic diet, testing yourself, because everyone is different. There's no one specific one size fits all ketogenic diet, you got to just measure to see if you're in nutritional ketosis. Then the second pillar that you mentioned, well, it's getting into actually getting yeah. into ketosis. And then it's the glutamine inhibition. So could you touch on the glutamine inhibition? Well, glutamine, bit? yeah, glutamine is the, is the fuel that, that provides the, the, the spark, the energy. It's the, it's the source of the energy that the cell needs to grow. The glucose carbons provide the, the, the raw materials to build new lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And the glutamine has two roles. It provides a nitrogenous source to build those other molecules, but it also provides a source for, uh, uh, for energy for the tumor cell the fermentation energy. So they can, they can obtain ATP from glutamine in the absence of oxygen or even in cyanide. So it becomes clear, where does this tumor cell get the energy to build new things, a new cell? So uh, they get it from glutamine. So um, you, know, you can take away the glucose to the tumor, but you still see the tumor there. Why is the tumor there? I took away all the glucose. It's not growing, but it's there. Okay, it's living on the glutamine. The glutamine is giving the energy, but the problem is if there's no fuel to build things, it can live, but it doesn't die. So what happens to, to, to take, you've got to do the two things. You've got to take away, you, you got to take away the carbons for new growth, and you have to take away the glutamine for the nitrogen and ATP synthesis. Um, and, and, what, and you need drugs to do that. You're not going to do it on a diet. People keep asking, oh, what kind of diet can I use to, get? no, you cannot. Let me say it again. There is no diet that I know of that's going to be totally efficient in getting rid of glutamine. You got to have a drug. And 6-deoxynorleucine, maybe phenylbutyrate. You know, there's some new ones that the pharmaceutical companies are building that might work, but they're not going to work by themselves. This is the big mistake. They're going to make millions and millions of dollars building glutamine inhibitors, but they're only using the glutamine inhibitor. They're not using the glucose inhibitors and putting the patients into therapeutic ketosis. So, um, so, so, I mean, this is the way it is. It's a three-step process. Therapeutic ketosis, glucose, and glutamine simultaneously targeted. You can use uh, parasite medications like benbendazole and bendazole. They seem to really attack these tumor cells very well, especially when the patient is in ketosis. And these are non-toxic drugs by and large. So, so um, yeah, the strategy is there. I mean, we know, exact, we know pretty much what to do. Uh, dosage, timing, and scheduling uh, optimization would be the final challenge. What are the best dosage, timing, and scheduling for this package of diet drug interactions? And I think once we have our handles on that, cancer is going to be an extremely manageable disease. People don't need to freak out. They, need, they don't need to get you know, traumatized and, de and depressed and all this kind of crazy stuff that we're, that we're experiencing today. None of this has to happen. You know, so uh, people, you know, if they, oh, I got cancer. Oh my God, I'm so depressed. I mean, now you have the opportunity to get rid of the cancer and get super healthy, do metabolic therapy. Oh, my doctor says it doesn't work. What does he know? Did he, this, this, did he do the experiments to test it? Did he, was he able to read the scientific articles supporting what I'm saying? A lot of times they've never read it. No, they've never read these articles. They never heard of it. Well, how in the hell are they going to know about it if they never heard of it? Right? So, I mean, you have to put all, this is the reason. 
This is why we people say, well, if I'm so right, how come everybody's not doing it? Um, and the answer is, you said, we, we talked about all the hurdles in front of this. And what are the types of cancers that you have seen this work in? Um, the better question is, what are the cancers that has, has not worked in? And um, we, we don't get, from what I've seen so far, although I haven't done the full, um, there are some rare tubers. Um, what are they called? That is a, a name for some of these cancers. But they never were hit with the drugs, uh, only diets. There are some, can the ketogenic diet does not do a great job in targeting glutamine. So there are some can people going, oh, I went on this ketogenic diet and only marginally helped me. Um, well, did you target the glutamine? No, no, I didn't target the glutamine. Okay, so you got to target the glutamine to get the full benefit from that. So um, <clears throat> I don't think, based upon all the, every one of the major cancers, breast, colon, uh, brain cancer, lung cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, all these different kinds of cancers, uh, all respond really, really well if you can simultaneously target the glucose and glutamine. So, uh, um, and no, very few studies, there are almost no studies uh, that, that, that do this. But uh, um, once they do it, they're going to realize that this is a very effective way, way to manage. We found that all the major cancers have mitochondrial abnormalities. And uh, that means they're not going to be able to generate energy through, what does that mean? They must ferment. Okay, if they ferment, they must use glucose and glutamine. So metabolic therapy is the way to target glucose and glutamine along with drugs and diets. And you can do that. It's very simple, not terrible. Um, the problem is patients don't, get, don't have access to the drugs, uh, unfortunately. Um, I'm that was going to sure be my they, next question. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing, you, the, you don't want to be Scare, uh, do the Scarelli you know, uh, process. Martin Scarelli, the guy, and, and the system allows the, I call it Scarelliing the drugs, um, where our society uh, jacks up the price of these drugs to an astronomical level uh, because they can, you know, like the EpiPen situation, you know, they used to be $2 and he made them $700. I mean, this, this, is a very, this is a very despicable kind of behavior, but it's being done all the time. Uh, and Bendazole in this country is like $350 a tablet, but in, in uh, Canada, it's like a dollar a tablet. So um, why you do this? You know, why, why, why would anyone want to do this? Yeah, greed. Bottom line is greed. So uh, um, how much money can we make on anything? But that's the, that's the Ameri isn't that the American way? I mean, they just said that about Facebook today, all over the news. They, they want to make money more than they want to control hate speech. Why? Money. <laughs> how, much, how much money? Forget about you know, all this stuff. It's the same thing with the drug companies. They want to make as much money as possible on these drugs. You know? um, so uh, revenue generation, number one, and then maybe uh, patient outcome, number two. So, um, but as long as you can generate revenue, right, that's the problem. One of the uh, outcome, one of the problems we have is that we're using repurposed drugs and uh, diets. You know, this is not something that's uh, going to be very attractive for revenue generation. But patients will will benefit immensely. And if your goal is to keep cancer at bay without toxicity, then this is the strategy, and the entrepreneurs will come. Listen, I'm not one of those guys. But I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to find out how to make some money on all this stuff. And once they do that, maybe people will become more comfortable with it. But until that time comes, we're just going to have to deal with the, uh, with, with the issues that we're dealing with now. So let's say someone were to be diagnosed with cancer and they wanted to do the metabolic therapy, but their doctor would not. Um, well, first of all, are the glutamine inhibitors prescriptions or can you get them over the counter? No, you can't get most of them over the counter. Um, you'd have to, you'd have to get a prescription for them. Okay. Um, you know, I think that's probably, they should be met readily available. Some are available, some aren't. And again, the pharmaceutical companies hold most of the cards when it comes to glutamine inhibitors. Um, so, but they're not ready to do that yet. They're still running some trials on a few of these things, but although I have to be honest with you, there are some that are out there. I haven't tested them yet. I haven't tested all the glutamine inhibitors. Uh, the one we work with is uh, Don, uh, deoxynorleucine, uh, which is a glutamine. 
the, the nice thing about Don is that it's a it's a what we in the pharmaceutical field it's called a dirty drug, and that means it hits multiple targets together. So it's not, and you can't patent the damn thing, and it's uh, very hard because oh, I can't make any money on it because it does so many different kinds of things. Who gives a shit? The, the bottom line: How's the patient going to do? That should be the number one thing, not how much money I can make on the damn drug, but how's the patient going to do? You know, I don't know. Don't get me started on that. But the, 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 the whole thing is, is that, um, yeah, the drugs are there. Uh, the technology, the, 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 uh, everything is there to drop cancer death rates by 50% in five years. It's already, in, it's already there if people want to do it. And if the, again, the doctors don't know. The standard of care is written by the American Medical Association to do certain things based on procedures. That has to change. That, that has to change dramatically. Uh, so doctors are opened up be surprised how many physicians would love to do this, but, they, but they're, they're restricted by the system. They can't do it. Um, they're gonna lose their license if they do it, they tell me. Oh, I can't treat a patient like that, it's not approved. What the hell, man? It's not gonna kill the patients. Patients are gonna get better, you know? But yet they'll use a terribly risky drug or, or radiation, which is like massively more risky than doing metabolic therapy. So, so if you know. require if you require a prescription to get one of these like like Don for example and your doctor just won't prescribe it because he doesn't know about this stuff you're you, you can't do anything about it. Well, the guys who have money, like anything else, if you're a rich person, you you buy you you get a physician, you have him buy it. Physicians can buy this stuff, and then you pay him to give it to give it to you. He'll do it, you know, uh, and sign some papers. You're not going to hold this guy liable for anything. Um, you know, and uh, there's ways to get around it if you have a few bucks, you know, but unfortunately, the poor people, they, they don't have that. They're not, you know, they have to deal with all these other things. Right. You know, and I just give knowledge. I can't tell anybody what they should do or what they should not do. All I can say is this, is here's the science, here's the evidence, then you, it's up to you to figure out how you're going to do it. And I'd say, we don't have clinics of metabolic therapy yet. Okay, it would be wonderful. In functional medicine, these functional medicine guys, they would have no problem at all setting up clinics for metabolic cancer therapies. No problem at all. If they would be allowed to do it, they would do it. So, um, and I think that's the future because the, the present cancer, what we're doing is, is a broken, terribly broken system, putting the lives of millions of people at risk uh, for toxicity and all kinds of stuff when it doesn't have to be that way. And, and and it's going to be a process to get the, the word out, get people trained, make them not fear they're going to lose their license if they do metabolic therapy. Education of the doctors, the patients, the system is all going to be necessary to move this thing forward. Dr. Seafried, you are very passionate about cancer. How did you get into working on cancer and metabolic? Well, therapy? we 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 did this. We were working on tumors. Uh, even at the time I was at Yale University years ago, but it was for the collecting data on the biochemical abnormalities in the tumors. It wasn't, it was completely disassociated uh, from anything that would be a, of therapeutic advantage, okay? It was pure what they call basic research stuff. You just look at things inside. And then we found all kinds of lipid abnormalities and all this. And I, I, I was in the field of ganglioside biochemistry and the ganglioside's are a type of, complex uh, glycolipids that were abnormal in cancer. We thought, we thought that was very interesting. And we, they're enriched in certain cell types and we were looking at all that stuff. But it wasn't until we started to, and I was in the epilepsy field for years and we knew that calorie restricted ketogenic diets were a powerful anti-epileptic therapy. And uh, we were studying tumors in the lab, we were studying epilepsy in the lab and we were using, and all of a sudden we said, what, what happens if we take mice that have cancer and put them on these ketogenic diets that we give to the mice that have epilepsy? And we also knew that the ketogenic diet for epilepsy did not work to block epileptic seizures unless the blood sugar was down and the ketones were up. The mechanism for that, we still don't know, probably. But we did the same thing for the animals that had the tumors. And it started to work really, really well. I said, oh my God, this, this is even better for the cancer than it is for the epilepsy. But uh, we realized that it wasn't good for stopping systemic metastatic cancer. If you know what that is, that's when the tumor cells spread all over your body. Until we made a fundamental discovery in the mouse, 
where we discovered a tumor that behaved just like glial, human glioblastoma and had all the characteristics of an immune cell, a macrophage. And now we know that all metastatic cancers have these characteristics of immune cells. And then we realized that the immune cell, which is a macrophage, loves glutamine. So, uh, and we couldn't kill it with ketogenic diets. And we said, what the hell? How come we can't kill this, this glioblastoma, highly metastatic cancers, with just ketogenic diets? Until we said it's got to be the glutamine. And that's when we used the Don together with the diet. It had the major, major effect on shutting down these tumor cells. So we've, now we've just um, toyed around with this and improving it all, over and over again. So we know now how to manage metastatic cancer, brain cancer, colon. We know how to manage them all. They're all dependent on glucose and glutamine. So you got to simultaneously target glucose and glutamine while putting the whole body in a state of therapeutic ketosis. Because when you take away glucose, you got to have an alternative fuel, and that fuel is ketone bodies. So the ketone bodies are really to help the normal cells. By targeting the glucose and the glutamine, you're killing the tumor cells. So it's a whole, it's unbelievable. It's actually, it's actually incredible when you think about it. <laughs> I don't know if you can think about it. But when I think about it, I'm overwhelmed. I'm saying, oh my God, you can, you can manage these terrible cancers, just making these little flips? And the answer is absolutely. <laughs> yeah, just gonna, it, I don't know how long it's going to take for people to come to know this. It, it's pretty um, incredible. And I think it's a much different, more hopeful and empowering message than there's nothing you can do but take chemo and radiotherapy and hear the statistics. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 absolutely. So, but the problem is, oh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, it hasn't been proven, blah, blah, blah. Well, the science, the science is clear. And we actually are treating patients or my physician friends uh, who have monitored. Pablo Kelly, go and talk to Pablo. You'll love, do a podcast on him. You know, he'll be more than happy to discuss his, his uh, strategy with you. And what are you going to say? It doesn't work? <laughs> I have people call him up. Hey, oh, I think you're a fluke. Oh yeah, what kind of fluke? The, the only fluke that uh, chose not to be irradiated and poisoned and brought his body into a state of therapeutic ketosis. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, get some of these people. Get the guys from Turkey who are seeing tremendous, their powerful therapeutic response in breast cancer and pancreatic cancer and advanced lung cancer. These are the guys who see the patients every day. They can tell you how they're doing. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, but they're basing it on our concepts. So it'll work. You know, it'll definitely work. It's just that you have to get more people doing it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. If you were to get diagnosed with cancer, other than these, this protocol, would you do anything else, like any type of supplement? Um, no, I, I would do what I tell, what, what I've, I've seen to work in my own lab and what I've seen to work on people who do it. Uh, I, would, I would, again, just like I told you, I would get my ass into, into nutritional ketosis as, as best I can and as fast as I can. And my blood work would be matched with the uh, GKI value. I wanna make sure my blood work is very, very good. I wanna make sure I have my GKI is uh, 2.0 or below. And then I would take uh, embendazole and, and Don. Yes, I would buy Don myself, absolutely. And I have friends that would give it to me. I'll, I'll, you know, I, I know how to do it. So, um, and I would do that. And then I would just uh, hang on and say, okay, here we go for the ride. Get this thing going, you know? But I, I tell you one thing, I, I would never take uh, radiation uh, uh, unless it were a type of cancer where the cure rate without recurrence would be greater than 90%. And it's certainly not for brain cancer and most of the other cancers. I would not take any drug that would make my hair fall out or give me blisters on the lips. I would not take any drug that didn't have the capacity to target glucose and glutamine. I mean, without glucose and glutamine, they can't grow. Why am I gonna worry about anything else, right? Why am I gonna worry about anything else if I know the, the, the Achilles heel of these tumor cells? I just have to target that and be as successful as I can at that. Now that's what I would do, all right? And uh, I hope I don't have to do it, but if I do, I, I know what to do. You know, so, I mean, that's just the way it is. Are there any risks to DON? Um, yeah, well, there's risks to everything. If you don't do it the right way and the dosage is too high and inappropriate, there are risks. You can shut down uh, your, your immune system. You could damage your gut. Uh, but when you're in therapeutic ketosis and use far lower concentrations of the drug, the, uh, the risk factors go way, way down. 
So it's like anything, any drug, that anything you put into your body has risks if you don't know how to use it. I mean, a ketogenic diet is a medicine. If you do it too aggressively and too much, you actually create a, a worse problem. So again, every part of the procedure is designed to work with the other parts of the procedure. So that uh, it, the, the greatest power is on the tumor cells killing them and enhancing the health and vitality of the normal cells. And you can screw that up if you don't know what to do. That's why some training and understanding is absolutely essential before you, you know, start doing an assembly line of people with ketogenic diets. You don't know what to do. You can't just do it. Oh, the diet doesn't work. Well, it wasn't done right. You know, with the, how many patients are in therapeutic ketosis when you when you uh, do that? Well, he wasn't. He couldn't get in there. And blah blah. And all this other stuff. So um, you got to do it right. If you do it right, it'll work. If you don't do it right, I can't. I don't know what's going to happen. Before we go. I wanted to ask you where people can find out more about your work. Well, I think um, I publish well, everything that I have said to you appears in our scientific publications. All of our scientific publications appear uh, open access, with the exception uh, of the provocative question. Uh, well, maybe that's even open, open access now, the one on the glioblastoma, the provocative question thing. Um, uh, but all the others, Pablo Kelly is open access. Uh, when I say open access, you can uh, go to uh, the public library, public uh, PubMed, public li library of medicine, and just put my last name in there. And then you'll see all the papers. And a lot of them will say free, free paper. Now I understand that, you know, some of the lay people are gonna read and say, ah, oh, man, I don't understand this stuff. Um, uh, but on the YouTube videos like this one or others, you know, I'm telling you uh, the, the, the overview, but, that, but if I, oh, people don't believe it, they have to read the science. And, you know, we just published a major paper in the journal Metabolites and Open Access with my colleague Christos Shinopoulos from Hungary. And uh, we did a compare and contrast the somatic mutation theory and the, and the meta, mitochondrial metabolic theory, which of the two theories can best explain the origin and management of cancer? And we put all the facts together in this in compare and contrast. And clearly the mitochondrial metabolic theory is better at explaining the origin and management of cancer than is the somatic mutation theory. And all majority of drugs in the pharmaceutical industry is based on the somatic mutation theory. So if the theory itself is flawed, then you know most of the drugs being produced by the top pharmaceutical companies are not going to work as well as they should, period. Okay, so how long is it gonna take that information to get out? So they should get people who understand some basic, you'd be surprised, what I'm amazed at is lay people become very, very smart uh, when their life might be at risk. You can't believe, if I, get, if I could get my students to learn things as fast as lay people, I'm, I would be, you know, great. They're here to get a grade, right? But, you know, when, when their life is now in jeopardy, man, you can't believe these people go to the dictionary, they're looking up words, they're looking up everything. They, it's like an educational experience. So why? Because they're going to die if they don't do this stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. so it's empowering to the patient. They learn, oh, I didn't know I, knew, I could know that much stuff. Yeah, well, right. you can. When there's right. motivation, right. you can be surprised what you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, before we go, uh, I do have rapid fire questions at the end, which I ask every single guest. So first, I hope I can answer this. What is the most important habit that you personally do every day to support your health? Well, I, I guess I don't eat breakfast. So um, why should I if I eat dinner at night? Why is the first thing I have to get up and eat something again? Right? I mean, give the body a break. Let it let it let it enjoy what you ate. And then I work out and then I eat lunch. So I just happen to have a job and be the gym is like right outside the lab here. So um, it's no, it's the, the convenience is, is, is very convenient. Everything is very convenient. So you do exercise and you skip a meal. Let's put it that way. Um, for most days, I wouldn't say it's every day, but most of the days of the week, it's something along these lines. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I just happen to have 
a, a position where I can do that. It's convenient for me. And I know when a lot of people are on the road driving and doing, I drive and everything, but I, but I also have access to all this other stuff. So, and what I say, you know, might be easier for me to do than it is for someone else, but that's what I do. And uh, you know, just hang on, you know, you're just trying to delay entropy. We're, you know, we're all gonna be, uh, you know, part of the planet here in a certain number of years, but uh, you just try to delay it as best you can. What do you eat in a day? Um, well, for lunch, I just had a handful of uh, nuts and a couple of, uh, of dates, you know, my almonds. And then, um, and then for dinner, I guess I'll have, I don't know, whatever my wife and I put together, some chicken, maybe some beef. I don't know. It's just a variety of stuff. I mean, I'm not limiting carbohydrates in my diet, uh, other than skipping meals and doing this and doing a lot of exercise. But yeah, I eat potatoes, rice. And, but if I had cancer, I wouldn't be eating that stuff. You know, you have to, and occasionally I don't. So, um, but I'm not, you know, doing, Jeff Bolick and De Don Diagostino, those are the guys. You want to talk about people who are like in the zone all the time. Um, I mean, those guys are, you ask Dominic what he eats, you're going to be. Oh, good. I would love to interview them. Go ahead, <clears throat> tell them you want to know what he eats every day. And you're going to say, whoa, I don't want to, I know what Dominic eats. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you because it's going to be a surprise when you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I think doesn't does he eat like mostly carnivorous? Yeah, he's pretty yeah. much, but he eats some vegetables too. But it's the type of carnivorous stuff that he eats. Okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna reach out to him again. Yeah, tell him, tell him you want to know. See if he told him he, he, to share his his meal plan with you. <laughs> <laughs> you see how many people embrace that. <laughs> <laughs> and final question: What advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Yeah, well, today we have a lot more knowledge about, I think the young people today, at least most of them, not at least the ones, of course, I'm with college kids every day, they're far more uh, conscious of their health uh, than they were in our day. Because uh, don't forget, we, uh, my, my parents emerged from the depression uh, and any food was good food, no matter what it was, uh, because nobody had food. I mean, it was like, well, we were always eating the potatoes every day or whatever it was. Um, because there was nothing else. But a lot of it, we didn't have highly processed foods enter into the food chain. I think it was until the 80s. So most of the stuff that we ate uh, was more natural. It wasn't totally, I mean, it might not have been the best stuff for us, but it was, it was more natural. Today, so much of the stuff is like, I don't know, it's processed stuff. You know, it's got all kinds of chemicals and crap in it. And it's just like the supermarket shelves. And I think the kids are becoming more and more um, aware of this. And we have an obesity epidemic. What's going on with that? You know, so obviously there's a lot of people that, that are not aware of that. So, I mean, there's no reason for a, a 20 year old person to be obese. Um, and yet we have type two diabetes increasing tremendously in the young. This was unheard of in the past. Um, so clearly, our environment puts us at risk for so many of these health, health problems. And, uh, and a lot of it, if you're poor and the food is cheap and it's tasty, it's engineered to be so tasty. Um, you know, flavors and scents and all that stuff. Um, and it makes, it's just so tasty. You ever eat, the, ever eat these McDonald's hamburgers? I mean, they're good. You know, um, uh, they're very tasty. But if you eat too many of them, it'll kill you. So you got to be careful. I'm not saying don't eat a McDonald's hamburger or eat a Dunkin' Donut, but you know a, a lot of that stuff is um, there's probably many things even worse. But you just do it very modestly. I, you know, I, I try to not eat that. I mean, uh, just don't eat that stuff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Doctor Seafried, right. it was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, well, I hope the information helps, and uh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.